Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Audhu billahi samiri min ash-shaytan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wal udwan illa ala al-zalimeen. Wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala abdika wa rasulika Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Tonight, inshallah ta'ala, we continue in the story of Amr ibn As radiallahu ta'ala anhu, but tonight we actually talk about him. So just a reminder, last week we covered his father and the amount of ayat that are about him. And I had several people come up to me and tell me, you know, I never realized that this is the man that we're talking about in all of these different verses. It's his father, Al-As. And then you have his brother, whose name was what? Hisham. Hisham ibn As radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The one who Amr ibn Asad was actually better than me, the unknown companion who preceded Amr ibn As into Islam and was one of the loyal followers of the Prophet throughout his entire life, imprisoned for a decade for his Islam and tortured and dies shaheed in the battle of Yarmouk. And tonight, inshallah ta'ala, we talk about Amr ibn As ta'ala anhu, whose story, subhanAllah, is actually towards the end of this, situated in none other than Gaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give the people of Gaza victory and protection and sustenance in these desperate moments of theirs. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restore us to these days of glory that we read about in these particular stories. Allahumma ameen. So we'll get to that, but subhanAllah, this is just the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had willed as we come into the order of the companions, where the focal point of his story becomes. But the theme is, of course, enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, whose children also inherited the enmity towards the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, and then went on to become some of the greatest reasons for the spread of Islam throughout the world. And so tonight, let's talk about this particular man, Amr ibn As. How many Amrs do we have here, by the way? No Amrs? We have no Egyptians here? We have one? Just Half of Masr is named Amr, for good reason, all right? His title, uh, according to Imam al-Dahabi rahimahullah, he says, Dahiyatu Quraysh, the most cunning of Quraysh. They used to call him Dahiyatul Arab, the most cunning of the Arabs, the politician of the Arabs. Warajulul Alam, a man of the world. Waman yudrabu bihi al-mathal. The person who examples are struck in regards to him. People would compare themselves to Amr, Fil fitna, not fil fitna, in his intelligence, wal daha, wal hazm. When it comes to his intelligence, his cunningness, and his strength of intelligence, his strength of mind. And he's described as Imam al Dhahabi rahimahullah says by Ibn Abdul Bar, Kana Amr min Fursani Quraysh wa Abtalihim fil Jahaliya mathkuran bidari kafihim. That Amr was a person who was a poet of Quraysh, he was a warrior of Quraysh, he was a horseman of Quraysh, كَانَ شَاعِرًا حَسَنَ الشِّعْرِ A person who had the most eloquent of speech when it came to his poetry. And so he kind of combined all of the qualities that were desired in Quraysh at the time. Now one of the things that's also important about and interesting about his life, Dhahabi rahimahullah narrates, وَكَانَ أَسَنَّ مِنْ عُمَرَ بْنِ الْخَطَّابِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ فَكَانَ يَقُولْ إِنِّي لَأَذْكُرُ لَيْلَةَ الَّتِي وُرِدَ فِيهَا عُمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ He actually was older than Umar ibn al-Khattab رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ And he used to say, I remember the night that Umar ibn al-Khattab was born. Now, the reason why this is an important part of understanding the context and the mindset of Amr ibn As, you had the elders of Quraysh that immediately took the Prophet ﷺ as an enemy because they felt threatened in their ways and of their tribal power. And then you kind of had the second generation. Khalid ibn al-Walid is a young man. Umar ibn al-Khattab is a young man. Amr ibn As is closer to the age of the elders of Quraysh. So he's the oldest of that group. And he's kind of situated in between the fathers and the sons when it comes to fighting the Prophet So he's one of the few, for example, who will fight the Prophet in both Badr and in Uhud, because many of those who came out in Uhud, like Khalid and Ikrama, they came out to avenge their fathers. Amr was there in both of these battles. So he's someone who's considered a senior amongst them, but he's not as old as the Abu Jahls and the Uqbas and, and some of the, the eldest of Quraysh. But he's older than uh, Umar and Khalid and that particular group of young men 
that would initially oppose the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How was Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala prepping this man for the journey ahead before he even became Muslim? One of the things that is said about him is that not only was he incredibly intelligent, but he was incredibly well-traveled, the most well-traveled of Quraysh, meaning he had gone to Asham, Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, multiple times. He had gone to Egypt multiple times. He had gone to actually what is Libya, modern day Libya, multiple times. He had gone to Abyssinia multiple times. He'd gone to Yemen multiple times. And so Amr ibn As had gone through all of these countries, as we know them now, all of these lands as a merchant. And he'd established a, re a relationship with all of the leaders, both from the Persian side and the Roman side, in the capacity of being a merchant. And how this plays out later on is that basically when Amr ibn As becomes a military general, he already knows the land, he's deeply familiar with the land, that he is about to engage in battle within. So it's interesting because even in his childhood, he's being prepared for this and he knows the terrain, he knows the corners, he knows the cities, he knows the fortresses, decades before he actually returns back to those lands as a Muslim. As we said, he was a poet. He was known as well for his generosity. And when his father passed away, Amr ibn As anhu inherited all of his money why do you think that is? Why do you think he inherited everything? Because his brother was in prison. His brother was at that time in prison for being a Muslim. And when Al-As died due to the dua of the Prophet ﷺ, the supplication of the Prophet of Allah against him, Amr inherited all of his money. So he combines now the intelligence, the reputation, the travel, He's kind of situated in this place in regards to his age where he can relate to the elders and he can relate to some of the youth. So he's considered the oldest of the young and the youngest of the old. That's his description, right? So he's situated throughout Meccan society. He's trusted and he is their politician, the politician of the Arabs. And that means everything negative before Islam and then taking that cunningness, taking that intelligence and using it uh, for good reasons after. As for his spouses, he would get married twice radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The first wife of his is named Rayta bint Munabbih. Rayta bint Munabbih radiallahu ta'ala anha and she's the mother of his famous son Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. The Prophet sallallahu said about them in an authentic narration, Amr ibn al-As min salihi Quraysh ni'ma ahlul bayti Abu Abdullah wa Ummu Abdullah wa Abdullah. That Amr ibn al-As is from the righteous ones of Quraysh what a blessed family they are, Abu Abdullah, Umm Abdullah, which is Rayta, and Abdullah ibn Amr, who becomes one of the great scholars of this religion. So this is his first wife, and he has one son through her. His second wife, uh, later on, who he marries way later, uh, is a woman by the name of Umm Kulthum bint Uqba ibn Mu'ayt. Now since the theme of this is all about how the enemies of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, their own children, after they oppressed the Prophet Muhammad for all of these years, their own children went on to become Muslims and went on to become good Muslims. Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt was the man who humiliated the Prophet in the worst of ways. He's the one who took the guts of a camel and collapsed the Prophet under those guts, took on all of the challenges to humiliate the Prophet around the Kaaba. And he's the one who ultimately triggered the dua of the Prophet ﷺ against the elders of Quraysh. You know that incident where Fatima radiallahu anha is cleaning the back of the Prophet ﷺ as he's shivering and he has no one to support him, no human being to support him? This is Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt. All six of Uqba's children became Muslim. So al Asa's children became Muslim, uh, Al Walid's children became Muslim, Abu Jahl's children became Muslim, Abu Lahab's children became Muslim. And Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt, all six of his children became Muslim. And particularly, this woman, Umm Kulthum, uh, she is the one who migrated from Mecca to Medina all by herself. She was the first woman to make hijrah all by herself, coming to Medina. Uh, and it was after Hudaybiyah, 
And she's the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, idha ja'akum al-mu'minatu muhajirat, famtihinuhunna, Allahu a'lamu bi imanihin. O oh, you who believe, when the female believers, when the women believers come to you as migrants, then test them and Allah knows best their belief. So she came to the Prophet ﷺ as a sincere believer after Hudaybiyah and Quraysh demanded that the Prophet ﷺ return her and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that instead she should be protected in Medina. The same woman, and I'm not gonna spend too much time with it, but it's pretty amazing. She married Zayd ibn al-Haritha and when Zayd was martyred, she married a Zubair ibn al-Awwam. And then after Zubair, she married Abdurrahman ibn Auf. And then after Abdurrahman ibn Auf, she married Amr ibn As. And she died and, uh, uh, in the Khilafah of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was actually her, her brother through her, her uh, mother. So he's actually her um, half-brother. So the same woman married all four of those companions, Amr being the last of them. And these are the, this is sort of the family dynamic of Amr ibn As radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and this is of course much later on in Islam. So as for now, it's simply his wife Rayta and then his son uh, Abdullah. Now where does his story start off? Amr inherited a greater enmity to the Prophet sallallahu than Khalid ibn al-Walid did. Amr deeply hated the Prophet sallallahu deeply plotted against the Prophet sallallahu used to scheme against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Khalid was more of call me to the battle and I'll make sure that you win the battle. Amr is someone who is in lockstep with his father, trying to make sure that they intercept the Prophet ﷺ at every route, they persecute the Muslims at every route. And so his story starts off where he uses his intelligence for all of the wrong reasons. And that's in Abyssinia. Abyssinia, of course, is ruled by a Christian king, a Najashi. And the Prophet ﷺ says that you should escape to Abyssinia because the ruler of Abyssinia will not tolerate injustice. He will not tolerate a dhulm and you should stay there until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieves you from your distress. And so a group of Muslims flee Mecca, going to Abyssinia, and in Habasha, you have Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, Ruqayya radiallahu anha, the daughter of the Prophet وسلم, Umm Salama, Asma bint Abi Bakr, Az Zubair. So many of the best of the companions are settled now in Abyssinia, seeking refuge from the persecution of Mecca. Now we mentioned last week that one of those as well that escaped to Abyssinia was who? Does anyone remember? Hisham, his own brother. His own brother. So Hisham ibn al-As was his brother through his father. So his own brother is there. And by the way, I found another brother amongst them from his mother's side. So he has another uh, brother by the name of Urwa ibn Uthatha. Urwa ibn Uthatha. So actually, both his brother from his father and his brother from his mother are of those that fled to Abyssinia. So he's really driven to capture them and to bring them back to Mecca so that they could be persecuted there. And Umm Salama radiallahu anha says that Amr ibn As had a good relationship with the Najashi. Remember, he's the politician of Quraysh. He knows exactly how politics works. He used to trade with the Najashi. He used to trade with the Romans. He used to trade with the Persians. And so Umm Salama radiallahu anha said that when we got to Abyssinia, we felt ease. And then we heard, we got the news that Quraysh had sent Amr ibn As and Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'a to basically bring us back. Amr is a politician. He knows how, he has a whole strategy in mind of how to sweeten up a Najashi so he can get these people back. So Umm Salama radiallahu anha says that Amr said, here's what we're gonna do. First, we're gonna get all of his advisors, all of his generals on our side. So he requests a meeting with the Najashi, but the night before, Amr ibn As visits each one of his confidants, all of his generals. And he gives them all sorts of bribes, leathers and skins and everything that they wanted from Arabia at the time. And as he sweetens them up, he says, listen, tomorrow I'm going to call a Najashi and I'm going to present to him that we have some people that have fled from us. And basically, I'm going to make an extradition request. I want them to come back to Mecca and I need you guys to all be on my side. Got it? We've got it. So he gave them all the money that they wanted, bribed them. and. Uh, sets up this meeting with a Najashi 
And basically the premise of his request to a Najashi is going to be that this is a domestic issue. This is a domestic issue. These are people that have caused a lot of trouble for us and they fled to your land. They're not on your religion, they're not on ours. So we're not going to get into theology yet. We're not going to talk about Christianity and Islam. We're not going to talk about idol worship because obviously, you know, the Meccans worship idols and Najashi's a Christian. But the only thing we're going to say is, they're not on your religion, they're not on mine, they're a group of suspicious people, heretics, they should not be trusted, and they caused us all sorts of trouble, and if you let them stay in Abyssinia, it's only a matter of time before they stir up some trouble here. So he's got, he's basically using anti-refugee rhetoric, right? It's going to be anti-immigrant rhetoric to a Najashi, and he wants to keep it very simple, that's the message. We have a good relationship, we have a treaty, send them back to Mecca, and we'll take care of them. We won't tell you what we're going to do to them, but we'll take care of them. So, and Najashi calls for Amr. They all come together, and his generals are around, all of his confidants are around. And Amr says to Najashi exactly what I just mentioned. He said, listen, there's a group of people that have fled from us after causing all sorts of trouble. It's a domestic issue. They're not on your religion, they're not on my religion, but we have a good relationship and we wouldn't want anything to go sour between Abyssinia and Mecca. Just send them back to us and we'll handle them. And Najashi says, what kind of a man would I be if I don't hear their case? I have to listen to them first. This is exactly what justice is. As the scholars mentioned, justice is hearing both sides and not being driven by bias. And Najashi to Amr, as you're going to see, he's like a fatherly figure to him. I mean, they have a really good relationship. He's known him for a very long time. But then Najashi says, well, I have, to, I have to hear them out. I have to give them a chance to explain to me who they are and why they fled to my land. They came here because they felt like they would find some refuge. So let me hear them out. And SubhanAllah, and Najashi had received a letter around that time that coincides with Amr coming from Abu Talib. Okay, from Abu Talib. And Abu Talib uh, says to him, does a Najashi still treat Ja'far and his friends kindly? Am Or has the troublemaker prevented him? Who's the Fatan? Amr ibn As. So his nicknamed in the letter as al fatan the guy that causes all sorts of trouble. Has al fatan stopped him from doing what he's supposed to do? He says, you are noble and generous. May Allah protect you. No refugee is disappointed by you and no one ever shamed. Know that Allah has increased you in happiness and prosperity because of your justice. You are a river whose banks overflow with bounty, which, re which reaches both your friends and your enemies. So Najashi kind of has the familiar friend in Amr ibn al-As, and he has somewhat of an idea that there's some sort of persecution that has led these people here, and he wants to demonstrate his justice, which is a consistent feature of a Najashi you know, due to his own history and due to his own religion. So Amr ibn As is in front of him and, and, and Najashi says, call the Muslims to me. So he calls forth Ja'far and the Muslims and Ja'far radiallahu anhu gives the most eloquent speech introducing Islam perhaps in history. Says to him, O king, we were a people in a state of ignorance and immorality. We used to worship idols and eat the flesh of dead animals. We used to commit all sorts of abominations and shameful deeds. We used to break the ties of family. We used to treat our guests badly. The strong amongst us used to exploit the weak and we remained in this way until God sent us a prophet from our own whose lineage, truthfulness, trustworthiness and integrity were well known to us. He commanded us to speak the truth, to honor our promises, to be kind to our family to be helpful to our neighbors, to abstain from bloodshed, to not appropriate an orphan's property or slander a chaste woman. So he goes on explaining the ethics of Islam. And this resonates with a Najashi. So a Najashi is listening to him and he looks at Amr ibn As and he says, I see nothing in these people that requires me to give them up to you. And you need to leave them alone, and whoever harms them will have to deal with me. So when Najashi says they're under my protection, and he 
lets Ja'far and the Muslims go back and he basically tells Amr and Abdullah that this is not going to work. The next day, Amr ibn As and Abdullah ibn Abi Rabi'ah are together. Uh, Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah are together and Amr says to Abdullah, I've got an idea. And Abdullah ibn Rabi'ah says, listen, you're pushing it. Khalas, it didn't work, go back home. Take the, take the L, right? Take the loss and just, it's not going to work. Don't mess with the Najashi. He was very steadfast in saying, I'm not going to turn them back. So just go back to Mecca. Let's deal with, we have plenty of Muslims to persecute over there in Mecca. And Abdullah even says to Amr, he says, look, at the end of the day, these people are our families. Like these refugees, these are our kin. Like this is getting a little bit too obsessive that we're that dedicated to persecuting our own. I mean, those are your only two brothers that are over there. And you're that committed. And Amr says, I'm not going to leave Abyssinia without all of them in chains. They're coming back with me. So he said, here's my idea. He said, do you notice they didn't say anything about Jesus? They didn't bring up Isa alayhi salam. So he said, what I'm going to tell Najashi because he's a Christian, I'm going to say, they say that Jesus is nothing more than a creature. And they say that he's not the son of God. It's okay for us to say that because we're idol worshippers in the first place. But they blaspheme about Isa alayhi salam. They claim to know better about Jesus than the Christians. So he says, I'm going to tell a Najashi, you forgot to ask them about Jesus. And if you ask them about Jesus, then you will see their blasphemy in action. So Najashi says, you know, sort of begrudgingly, fine, I'll give them one more chance. I'll give you one more chance to let them, you know, come and present their religion, uh, present their case, and you be there. So Najashi gathers them all together. Amr ibn As is excited. He once again talked to the generals. He's got the generals on his side. And then Najash, he's a smart man. He knows something is going on. He knows that there's some plotting happening. And he knows the games that are being played. And Najash, he says, what do you say about Isa ibn Maryam? What do you say about Jesus, the son of Mary? Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, we do not say anything more or less than what God said about him himself in the Qur'an. So he told him, recite to me those verses. And Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu recited the verses about Jesus and Mary السلام, in Surah Maryam up until ma min walad, that it is not befitting for God to have a begotten son and when he finishes reciting he looks up and a Najashi is crying and the bishops are crying and this is what uh, many of the scholars mentioned the verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنُهُمْ تَفِيغُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ when Allah says that of the righteous Christians are those who when they hear the revelation, then you will see their eyes filled with tears because they recognize this as the truth. This makes sense. Jesus, peace be upon him, a great prophet, a great messenger. This makes sense. And then Najashi, you know, was, you know, if, if you look up Eastern Christianity and, and you know, some of the types of Christianity that were present in Africa, it's a little further removed from Roman influence. So it's a little closer to the monotheism and to Islam when you look into the types of Christianity that are practiced there in Africa. And Najashi hears this. And and Najashi stands up and he comes towards Ja'far radiallahu anhu and he takes the stick and he draws in the line and he says, Wallahi ma kharaja Isa ibn Maryam an hadha al-Ud. So Jesus, peace be upon him, does not exceed what you have said by the length of the stick. And at that point, the generals that Amr bribed, like Amr is like, oh no, this backfired. And the generals that Amr bribed start to grunt, right? And then Najash, he says, even if you grunt, even if you grunt, these people are under my protection. And he looked at Ja'far and he said, Man sabbakum gharim. If someone insults you, I will find them. If someone insults you, he's talking about his own people, I will find them. And then Amr starts to sort of say to a Najashi, but they say he's not the son of God, right? He's trying to cause fitna. He's trying to make this worse. He's trying to poke. And then Najashi basically yells at Amr ibn As and he says, Idhab. He says, go back. And he said, whoever. He turned towards Ja'far. And he said, Man darabaka qataltuhu. If someone hurts you, I will kill them. In front of Amr ibn As. So Amr ibn As knows, radiallahu anhu, that he failed in his mission. 
And the last words that an Najashi said, it was a famous statement. قَالَ وَاللَّهِ مَا أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِنِّي الرَّشْوَةَ فَآخُذُ الرَّشْوَةَ حِينَ رَدَّ عَلَيَّ مُلْكِي وَمَا أَطَاعَ النَّاسَ فِيَّ فَأُطِيعُ النَّاسَ فِيهِ He said, Allah did not take a bribe from me when He gave me back my kingdom. So how can I take a bribe from my kingdom? And Allah did not do what they wanted Him to do against me. So how can I do what they want me to do against Him? It's a very it's a complicated statement. And if you go back and you watch the lecture of Al-Najashi, it's referring to the, the, uh, the attempt on his life when he was younger and Allah saving him from his own uncle and from his own cousins who tried to kill him and putting him back on the throne. So Najashi is saying, God took care of me when I was in a vulnerable place. So why would I betray God when I'm not in a vulnerable place? So I can't do what the people want me to do when Allah did not let the people do to me what they wanted to do. And so he tells Amr to go back and to leave. And then he dismisses everybody from his court except for Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he secretly tells Ja'far that he embraces Islam. So he, he embraces Islam with Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu. In that state, Amr ibn Az comes back to Mecca on his first ever failed diplomatic mission. Absolutely humiliated, embarrassed. And people are saying, even Amr ibn Az could not bring them back. And some of the people said, surely that's a sign that Muhammad either receives revelation or he's a magician. Because no one could escape Amr's tricks. The man is too good of a diplomat. He's too smart, too slick to come away with not a single Muslim in his hand from Abyssinia. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would decree that some of the Muslims come back from Abyssinia thinking that Mecca had softened towards Islam including his brother Hisham. Amr takes his anger out on Hisham, on his own brother. They capture those Muslims, they torture them. Some of them are able to flee to Medina. Some of them are stuck in Mecca, including Hisham, who will remain in that torture for 10 years. During that time, Al-As dies from the dua of the Prophet And remember, Amr ibn As went to Ta'if to try to find a doctor to cure his father. And his father died from the dua of the Prophet and so Amr became even an angrier opponent to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He fights the Prophet Sallallahu in Badr. After Badr, he goes back out in Uhud. And he was commanding one of the flanks of the army against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's one of the main architects of the Battle of Khandaq. Now, you've got to understand that after Uhud, the people of Mecca thought that this is it we can carry out a genocide against the Muslims. We can wipe them all out of Medina. They gather the largest army in the history of the Arabs, attack Medina, and Allah spares the Muslims with the khandaq, with the trench that they build around themselves. So Amr ibn As, ta'ala anhu, as he's plotting against the Prophet وسلم, something fascinating happens here. The Prophet وسلم, makes a dua against Amr. The Prophet وسلم, Praise against Amr. Now, this is, this is where it gets very interesting because you know when you make dua and we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the supplication in a way that's even better. We saw what happened to the people the Prophet ﷺ prayed against. I mean, he prayed against his father and he stepped on a thorn and it killed him. So when he raises his hands to make dua against Amr al As, I mean, the Prophet ﷺ has made dua against Abu Jahl and Uqbah and all these people. And look what happened to them. But Allah reveals Qur'an in response to the Prophet ﷺ's dua against Amr ibn As. Who can tell me what that ayah is? Surah Ali Imran. لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ شَيْءٌ أَوْ يَتُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ أَوْ يُعَذِّبَهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ ظَالِمُونَ It is not in your hands, O Muhammad ﷺ. For Allah will choose whether to accept their repentance or to punish them. For verily, they are transgressors. This is one of the most fascinating incidents of the Qur'an responding to the Prophet ﷺ's dua that we find. And subhanAllah, remember Hisham, his brother, is one of the reasons for the revelation of the verse, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَةُ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say, O oh my servants who have transgressed against themselves, do not despair from the mercy of Allah. Because Hisham thought, because he was tortured into leaving Islam, that he had no way back. So Allah reveals a verse to Hisham ibn al-As, or about Hisham ibn al-As, don't despair of the mercy of Allah. And for Amr ibn al-As, 
Do not say he's deprived of the mercy of Allah. Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's a plan for this man. As annoying as he is, as much as you hate him, as much as he's done to you, laysa laka min al-amri shay. This is not your decision for Allah to damn him or for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cast him into the fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide him or punish him as he sees fit. So what happened here? Where, where is the change of heart? I mean, you can imagine all the years now between the Prophet ﷺ and Amr al he's orchestrated and architect all of these attempts on the Prophet ﷺ's life. Amr ibn al-As anhu says, لَمَّنْ صَرَفْنَا مِنَ الْخَنْدَقِ That when we finished Khandaq, like when we surrounded Medina from all sides, and we carried out that attack on Medina and we failed, he said, جَمَعْتُ رِجَالًا مِنْ قُرَيْشِ I basically got together some of my trusted friends from Quraysh. And I said, Wallahi inna amra Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ya'lu uluwan munkara. He said, listen, uh, I see that this is not going our way. <laughs> the affair of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seems to be moving in a direction to where if he survived this attempt, I think he's going to win. So he said, I have an idea. They said, Mahu, what's your idea? Look at the way this becomes so poetic. He says, Let's go back to a Najashi and let's us be the refugees. Let's go to Najashi and let's ask him for protection. The way that the Muslims sought protection from him the first time. He said, so if we win, if our people win, If the people of Mecca beat the people of Medina, beat the Muslims, we'll just come back to Mecca. Not a big deal. We have enough goodwill with the leaders in Mecca and with Quraysh that we can simply come back and we can pretend this never happened. He said, وَإِنْ يَظْهَرْ مُحَمَّدْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, But if Muhammad وسلم, wins, فَنَكُونُ تَحْتَ يَدَيْ النَّجَاشِ And he said, for us to be under the rule of a Najashi, أَحَبُّ إِلَيْنَا مِنْ أَنْ نَكُونَ تَحْتَ يَدِي مُحَمَّدْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. It's better for us to be under Najashi than to be under the rule of Muhammad وسلم, because what he's going to do to us if he gets control over us, we don't even want to see that. So his idea is, let's go back to Abyssinia and let's say we're in trouble, we want your protection and we have that goodwill. So they said, that's a good idea. Let's do it. He says, فَبْتَعُوا لَهُ هَدَايَا We went and we bought all the best gifts in the world for Najashi. And he says, وَكَانَ مِنْ أَعْجَبِ مَا يُهْدَى إِلَيْهِ مِنْ أَرْضِنَا الْأَدَمُ and it was the best of gifts that we could give to him. The skins, the perfumes, everything. We surrounded a Najashi with all sorts of gifts. And he said, we're walking into the palace of a Najashi. فَوَافَقْنَا عِنْدَهُ عَمْرُ ibn Umayyah. And we found with him Amr ibn Umayyah رضي الله عنه قد بعثه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في أمر جعفر وأصحابه. The Prophet sent Amr ibn Umayyah, a companion, to a Najashi to tell a Najashi, send me Ja'far and my companions to Medina now. Because if you remember, the Muslims of Yemen and the Muslims who escaped to Abyssinia came to Medina after Khandaq. So it just so happened, SubhanAllah, Amr ibn As says, I'm walking into the palace of a Najashi and I see Amr ibn Umayyah and I'm like, what's going on here? The ambassador of the Muslims. And he had sent him at that time to send back uh, some of the Muslims that, is, that, that had escaped persecution in Mecca in the first place. Amr could not escape his ignorance at that time. And when I say his ignorance, I don't mean his intellectual ignorance, his arrogance, right? And sort of the causes of jahiliya. So he says, فَلَمَّا رَأَيْتُهُ قُلْتُ لَعَلِّي أَقْتُلُهُ He said, when I saw him, I said, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to take him out here in Abyssinia. I'm going to get this man. So he says, وَأَدْخَلْتُ الْهَدَايَا So I, I brought in the gifts to a Najashi. So an Najashi said to me, Marhaban wa ahlan bi sadiqi. Welcome, welcome to my good friend. Remember, he's like a father figure to Amr. We have an old relationship. Wa ajiba bil hadaya. He liked the, the gifts that I brought him. So I said to him, Ayyuha al malak, inni ra'aytu Rasulah Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam indak. I saw the messenger of Muhammad with you. Wa huwa rajlun qad wa tarana wa qatala ashrafana. This is a man that caused us a lot of problems in Mecca and he killed some of our leaders in Mecca. So he says, so give me the permission, adribu unaqa. Let me handle him. Will you give me permission to attack him? So Amr sort of lost the plot of the mission. The mission was asked for protection, but he saw Amr ibn Umayyah and he wanted to kill him. 
so bad that he asked the Najashi, can we go fight outside? Can I just, can you give me and him a moment outside of the palace and let me handle him? And this is where it gets interesting. The narrator says, فَغَضِبَ النَّجَاشِ And Najashi got so mad. وَضَرَبَ أَنْفَهُ ضَرْبَةً ضَنَنْتُ أَنَّهُ قَدْ كَسَرَهُ He punched Amr so hard that he almost broke his nose. Like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Wake up! And he said, Amr ibn As said, that at that point, I wished the earth would swallow me because I felt so stupid for saying that. Like, I shouldn't have done that. That was a dumb move. I should know better not to interfere with the core mission, which is to seek refuge. So I said to him, لَوْ ظَنَنْتُ أَنَّكَ تَقْرَهُ هَذَا لَمْ أَسْأَلْكَ That if I knew that this would upset you so much, I wouldn't have asked you this, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have asked you <laughs> to fight him outside the palace or to kill him outside the palace. And then Najashi says to him, Ya Amr, when are you going to wake up? He says, what are you talking about? He said, you asked me to give you the messenger of the man, رَجُلًا يَأْتِيهِ النَّامُوسُ الَّذِي كَانَ يَأْتِي مُوسَى you have asked me to give you the ambassador of the man who the angel that used to come to Moses comes to. Now, by the way, this is really interesting, subhanAllah, in the history of Sirah, because Waraq ibn Nufal, who was also a Christian scholar, right, in Mecca, what did he tell the Prophet after his encounter with Jibreel alayhi salam? He said, Hadha namus, this is a namus, the secret teller who used to come to Musa salam, used to come to Moses. And Najashi clearly reads the same scripture, knows the same books, he uses the exact same language. He says, you want me to give up a man who is the ambassador of the messenger, a man who Jibreel, Gabriel descends upon, the way he used to descend upon Musa. Amr ibn al-As says, at that point, I woke up. <laughs> like subhanAllah, Iman struck me at that point. Faith came to me at that point, like wait, and Najashi believes this too? Because remember, Najashi didn't tell him that he became Muslim the last time around. So he says, Wa inna dharika la kadalik. He says, wait, is it really like that? Like, is he really a messenger of Allah? And Najashi says, yes. And he says, Wallahi inni laka nasihun. Fattabi'hu. He said, I am giving you advice. I swear by Allah that I'm giving you sincere advice, Amr. Go back and follow him. فَوَاللَّهِ لَيَظْهَرَنَّ كَمَا ظَهْرَ مُوسَى وَجُنُودُهُ He said, I swear that Allah will give him victory the way that Allah gave Musa and his people victory over the Pharaoh. This is really interesting. Amr has seen the Prophet ﷺ for all these years and he said, faith never entered my heart. But he trusted in Najashi and he found in Najashi to be an intelligent man and he knew how learned he was in the scriptures. And this coincides with what he sees now, that there's something divine that's giving the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam victory. And now when Najashi is telling him like a father, wake up, realize this man is who he says he is, and I believe in him too, now go back and follow him. And Amr ibn As anhu says, at that moment I said to him, أَيُّهَا Malik, O king, فَبَيَعْنِي أَنْتَ لَهُ عَلَى الْإِسْلَامِ let me take a pledge with you upon al-Islam. I want to become Muslim through you. So what does a Najashi become? The only tabi'i in history to give shahada to a sahabi. A Najashi never met Muhammad Wasallam. So he's from the second generation technically, a tabi'i, a follower of the Prophet Wasallam who never met him. The only man in history that was a tabi'i that gave da'wah and gave shahada to a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. So he said, فَبَسَطَ يَدَهُ So Najashi extended his hand. فَبَايَعْتُهُ لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمُ عَلَى الْإِسْلَامِ So I, I took an oath with the Najashi, a covenant with him, with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, upon Al-Islam. I accepted Islam through a Najashi. And then he said, ثُمَّ خَرَجْتُ إِلَىٰ عَمْرِ بْنِ أُمَيَّةِ so then I came out and I went to Amr ibn Umayya and I hugged him and he hugged me. So I embraced him and he embraced me. So now Amr ibn Umayyah is going to go back to the Prophet ﷺ. Whoever gets to him first is going to tell the Prophet ﷺ that Amr ibn As is coming to you as a Muslim this time. 
So he said, my people were waiting outside. And subhanAllah, by the way, I think this is an important thing because Ibn Abdul Barr mentions this as a note. Sometimes you need someone else to recognize the truth for you to really be affirmed in it. Uh, you know, I think about all like those MSA lectures when like we'd bring like Yusuf Estes to like talk about Islam or something like that and like 95% of the audience was Muslim <laughs> already, right? But hearing other people, right? receive the message, it validates when you see someone take shahada, like it's another form of increase of your own iman so it increased in Amr ibn As this idea that, man he really must be the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa if a Najashi believes this too it must be true so he said, so I went out and I hugged Amr ibn Umayyah فَخَرَجْتُ ala ashabi, and I went out to my companions they're waiting to hear the news if uh, if a Najashi has given us refuge all of his non-Muslim companions so they they said, ma wara'ak, they said, what happened with the Najashi? Fakultu khair. Good things happened. Right? And it was nighttime. So he said, I'll talk to you about it in the morning. I'll tell you the plan in the morning. All right? <laughs> Amr ibn As said, we went to sleep. He said, as soon as all of my companions were asleep, I got on my camel, one talaktu wa taraktuhum, and I left them all in Abyssinia. And he said, I made my way straight to Medina. Right? I was like, all right, forget these guys. I'm going to Medina. Because if he tells them what happened, if he tells them he's Muslim now, then he risks being killed by them at this point. These are enemies of the Prophet. ﷺ. So he said, I made my way to Medina. فَبَاللَّهِ inni لَأَهْوِي He said, I, I swear by Allah that as I was going out to Al Medina, in the desert, who does he bump into? Khalid bin al Walid radiallahu anhu. His friend Khalid and Uthman bin Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Khalid ibn al Walid, Khalid, who we spoke about, right? Who was the one who, you know, obviously orchestrated that uh, maneuver in Uhud and whose father was a staunch enemy of the Prophet. Uthman ibn Talha, whose mother was the one that put the bounty on the head of Asim ibn Thabit and said, I want to drink alcohol out of his, his skull. And Uthman ibn Talha and Khalid ibn Walid have decided to become Muslim and they're making their way to Medina. And Amr ibn As says, I bumped into them. If you go back to Khalid's story, you'll hear the narration from Khalid's vantage point. Now you get to hear it from Amr ibn As's uh, vantage point. He says, Ila aina ya Abu Sulaiman. Where are you going, Abu Sulaiman? Khalid radiallahu anhu is not scared of anybody. Khalid says, Adhabu wallahi usnim inna rajula la nabiyun ma ashukku fihi. Khalid said, I'm on my way to become Muslim. This man is a prophet. I have no doubt about it at this point. And Amr says, in that case, وَأَنَا وَاللَّهِ I'm in the exact same position. Let's go become Muslim together. Now subhanAllah, what's really interesting is if you go back to Mecca, remember there was an incident where the leaders of Quraysh would go out secretly to listen to the Qur'an. They'd listen to the Prophet ﷺ at night. And then they bump into each other. And then say, wait, are you Muslim? Like, no, I'm not really sure. Not yet. Of course not. And they basically convinced themselves to stay outside of Islam. Even though they knew the Qur'an was speaking to them. But their hearts were turned away. They couldn't do it. Here, you have the meeting of the sons. And they say, you know what? We're going to go become Muslim. It's about time. And so Medina, subhanAllah, after they survived Khandaq, where they're being bombarded, you have Ja'far radiallahu anhu and the Muslims who fled to Abyssinia on a ship coming from Abyssinia. You have the Muslims from Yemen coming on a ship to Medina. And now you have the Prophet ﷺ sitting in Medina and he receives the last of the Muhajirun, the last people to make hijrah, to migrate to the Prophet ﷺ, Amr and Khalid and Uthman. And when they come to the Prophet ﷺ, he is so happy to see them approaching him and he knows sallallahu alaihi wasallam that they're coming to him different than before they're not here to attack him this time they're here to embrace him so he says so we went up to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam extended his hand to take that pledge from each of us khalid radiyallahu anhu gave the pledge to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uthman ibn talha gave the pledge to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Amr ibn As anhu said that the Prophet extended his hand and then as I was about to extend my hand, I did this. The Prophet looked at him like, are you serious? Like, what now? Right? Amr is a diplomat. 
He's intelligent. He says, Ya Rasulullah, Ubayiruka ala an yughfarali ma taqadama min dhambi. Walam athkur ma taakhar. He said, look, I've done a lot of bad stuff to you. So this bay'ah, this pledge that I'm taking with you, I will take it with you on the condition that all of my previous sins are forgiven. And I'm not, I'm not mentioning what comes later. Like, I understand it's not reasonable to say that I should be forgiven in advance for some of the shortcomings I might have later. And by the way, remember this statement when we get to his death. Remember this particular part of the statement when we get to his death, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, look, I did a lot of things to you. I fought you in every single battle. Khalid fought you once, I fought you every single time. I plotted against the Muslims in Mecca, the Muslims in Abyssinia. I have a lot of dirt on my record. And the Prophet wasallam said, Ya Amr, O Amr, take your pledge. Bayi' fa inna al-Islama yajubbu ma kana qablahu. Take that pledge because don't you know that Islam does away with everything before it? And in one narration, the Prophet said, and Hijra does away with everything before it, and Hajj, Mabrur, does away with everything before it. The point here, though, very interesting. Notice the Prophet did not say, I'm, uh, he didn't say that for you, I'll forgive all of your previous sins. Because that would be unethical. Right? If the Prophet makes an exception for Amr ibn As, because I really want him to be Muslim, and I'll tell him, okay, fine, for you, you're all forgiven. The Prophet said, don't you already know that this is baked into the contract of Islam? When you become Muslim, all of your previous sins are forgiven. This is already there. And Amr ibn As said, Alhamdulillah. So he took his pledge with the Prophet SubhanAllah, it was only shortly after that that the Prophet stands up in the masjid and he says, لَقَدْ مَاتَ الْيَوْمْ رَجُلٌ صَالِحٌ a righteous man has just passed away. Who was it? And Najashi has died in Abyssinia. And Jibreel has just informed me of his death. These are these small connections that are so beautiful. Najashi told Amr, the last thing he told him before he became Muslim is that this is the man upon whom Jibreel descends upon. And the Prophet is saying, and the angel Gabriel just descended upon me to tell me that a man died thousands of miles away. لَقَدْ مَاتَ الْيَوْمْ رَجْلٌ صَالِحٌ so everyone stand up and pray janazah on him. So Amr ibn As praised janazah on the one who gave him shahada in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Subhanallah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, obviously, if you are hearing this story, there could be a doubt in your heart: like, did he really become Muslim for the hereafter, or was he just sort of playing the cards here? Was he kind of just weighing the options and watching the way the political affairs were going? Was Amr making a political move or was he making a move of faith? The Prophet ﷺ said, Ibn al-As mu'minan. The two sons of al-As are two believers. Amr wa Hisham. Both of them are believers. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, In Amr ibn As la Rashid al-Amr. That Amr ibn As is a person who's guided in his affairs. And in one narration, this is a beautiful one. The Prophet ﷺ said, Aslam al nasu wa amana Amr ibn As. While other people may have just become Muslim, Amr ibn As truly believed. Like this is a man who Iman, who faith has truly entered into his heart. And so Amr radiallahu anhu, you know, is like Khalid radiallahu anhu, where he says that this was the most hated person in the world to me, and now he's the most beloved person in the world to me. And he immediately wants to live up to this iman that he has, this faith that he has. So in Medina, one night, there was a, a loud noise that takes place outside of Medina. And Amr ibn As says, I and Salim Mawla Abi Hudayfa, we grabbed our swords and we immediately rushed to the boundary of Medina to protect Medina. And the Prophet said, Ayyuhan Nas, O people, Alla fa'altum kama fa'ala hadhan al mu'minan. Would you not have done what these two righteous believers have done? It's a testimony to his faith, to his iman. So Amr radiallahu anhu knows that he's gaining the trust of the Prophet sallallahu And the Prophet sallallahu is testifying to his iman. Now for Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu, the battle of Mu'tah happens two weeks later. And that's the moment of Khalid bin Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So he has his moment quickly to prove himself to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Khalid was like, put me to work. Khalid radiallahu anhu knows one thing, battle. Put me in the battlefield. I don't do any of the other stuff. Amr al As does the diplomacy, does all the other stuff. Put me in the battlefield. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa put him to work. 
Amr ibn As has Dhatu Salasil. Dhatu uh, Salasil is not the big Dhatu Salasil, the, the, the battle against the Persian Empire that we talked about in the time of Khalid. This is a small um, battle that takes place with the Roman Empire who are now closing in and becoming more aggressive towards the Muslims as they see them rising to become a legitimate political power. So Amr ibn As anhu tells the story. And this is only a few weeks after he became Muslim. The Prophet sent me a message. The Messenger said to me, That dress yourself for war and bring forth your, your armor, your weapons, and come to me. I came to the Prophet and he was making wudu. He looked up at me as he was making wudu, and when he finished his wudu, he said to me, Inni uridu an ab'athaka ala jaysh, that look, I'm going to send you as a commander over a battalion. And he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will surely give you victory, wa yughnimak, and the spoils of battle as well. Amr ibn As took offense to that. Why? Because it's like, you know, that's what the Arabs used, they used to take the spoils, they used to fight for spoils, they used to fight for taking the other army, the opposing army stuff after the battle, collecting the ghanima, connecting the spoils. So Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu, he said, I said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, ma aslamtu min ajlil ma. I didn't become Muslim for money. Walakinni aslamtu raghbatan fil Islam. I became Muslim for Islam. وَلَأَنْ أَكُونَ مَعَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. And so I could be with the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. And the Prophet وسلم, told him, relax. نِعْمَ الْمَالُ الصَّالِحِ لِلرَّجُلِ الصَّالِحِ So he praised him again. He said, the best form of, uh, of, of mal, of, of property, is righteous property for a righteous man. Meaning what? This is not like you're going, and you're, you're going on some raid attacking some group of people to steal their stuff, right? This is the stuff that comes in the capacity of nobility, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees it for you. So don't take this as a read on your iman, just go ahead and take it. So the Prophet appoints Amr ibn As as a commander of an army. Now by the way, if you're a Muslim who fled Mecca to Abyssinia, and who fought Amr in all of these battles, and he's only been Muslim for a few weeks, and the Prophet says he's your commander, kind of looking at that and you're like, okay, we hear and we obey, but this is an interesting decision. On top of that, amongst the people who Amr was in charge of were Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhuma. 300 men, amongst them Abu Bakr and Umar. So he's putting the best of the companions under Amr ibn As, who just became Muslim. And this could, if, if the Prophet وسلم, is not divinely inspired, like this could go really bad. If Amr is just playing around, he could go ahead and kill the top Muslims and he could go back to Mecca and he could say, I got him. This is also part of the Prophet وسلم, growing these men, growing these people. So they went out at night, فَأَصَابَهُمْ بَرْدْ شَدِيدٌ And they were struck by a cold, cold, cold breeze. And so the Muslims wanted to kindle fires because that's how you keep yourself warm. And Amr radiallahu anhu comes out and he says to them, لا يوقدن أحد النار. Not a single one of you light a fire. So they're freezing at night. So one of them goes back to the Prophet وسلم, complaining. And a group of them go to the Prophet وسلم, complaining, we don't know about this guy. And the Prophet وسلم, calls Amr and Amr says to him, Ya Nabi Allah, كَانَ فِيهِمْ قِلَّةً فَخَشِيتُ أَنْ يَرَى الْعَدُوُ قِلَّتَهُمْ So the Messenger of Allah, we're a small group. The Romans are huge. We're only a few hundred men. And if we lit our fires, then they're smart enough if they sent some spies out to be able to tell that we're a really small group of people. And so they'd easily be able to overtake us. And so I didn't want to give them anything to track us by. So the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ liked Amr's thinking. Okay, that makes sense. And then they go out and Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu leads them in salah. I mean, the new Muslim guy leads them in salah. On top of that, in this narration, he was in a state of janabah. Okay, which means that Amr radiallahu anhu was supposed to do ghusl, he was supposed to take a shower before he led them in prayer. Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu did a modified version of that. <laughs> and so the Prophet asked the companions, how did you find your Amir? And 
they praised him. But they said, Ya Rasulullah, Salla bina wa huwa junub. He prayed in front of us and he wasn't in he was in a state of Janaba. So the Prophet called Amr anhu to him and he told him, What is it that I'm hearing about you leading the companions in prayer while you weren't in a state of proper wudu? So he told him, Ya Rasulullah, it got really cold. And he said, and Allah says in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا Don't kill yourselves, Allah is merciful with you. And he said, وَلَوْ اِخْتَسَلْتُ مِتْتُ He said, and if I would have taken a shower, I would have died of the cold. فَضَحِكَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ So the Prophet laughed and he let it go. Meaning that was the ijtihad of a companion, that was his using his own judgment in that moment. And at the end of the day, Amr al ta'ala anhu was successful. The salah of everyone else was valid. I'm not going to get into a fiqh tangent right now, right? This will be a complete waste of my time right now to not be able to, to tell the story. In any case, the Prophet also sends reinforcements. He sends Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah radiallahu anhu as a reinforcement. Now, when Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah comes, Abu Ubaid radiallahu anhu is a man, immediately when the companions see him, they immediately know he's in charge. So there was a little bit of a, a confusion when Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu showed up with his men to reinforce Amr ibn al-As, who's in charge. And Amr ibn al-As radiallahu ta'ala anhu goes up to Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu and says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put me in charge, so you're under my commands. You understand? Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu says, I understand, under your command. And the companions are looking like, you've got to be kidding us. Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, and he's under the command of Amr ibn al-As. And this, by the way, again, is a sign of Aminu Hadihi al Ummah, the trustworthy one of this Ummah. Abu Ubaidah radiallahu anhu, just like with Khalid radiallahu anhu later on, right? He doesn't give, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't cause any rupture in the army. He simply says, you know what, for the sake of the Muslims, we're going to go with this. The point is, there is an adjustment period here for Amr ibn As radiallahu ta'ala anhu, right? And this is important to understand. In any case, they're given success, they're given victory. Khalid radiallahu anhu was given victory in Mu'tah. The two enemies of the Prophet sallallahu come home with victory. Right? Now Amr ibn As radiallahu ta'ala anhu talks about the development of the love that he had for the Prophet sallallahu His own heart now and how it's developing a love for the Prophet sallallahu He says, Inni la ashaddu nasi haya'an min rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Fama mala'tu aini minhu wa la raja'tu. He said, I was so shy with the Prophet ﷺ that I would not even be able to make eye contact with him. I couldn't even stare at him out of love and awe of the Prophet ﷺ. And he tells the famous story. He says that after that to Salasid, I won the battle. The Prophet ﷺ is giving me all of this empowerment. He's putting me in a position to succeed. He's showing me love ﷺ. So now you understand the context. We're sitting amongst the companions. I say, Ya Rasulullah, man ahabun nasi ilayk. Oh, Messenger of Allah, who's the most beloved of people to you? Like, go ahead and tell them. Tell all these people how much you love me. Right? So the Prophet says, What? Aisha. <laughs> My wife, Aisha radiallahu anha. He says, No, Ya Rasulullah, min rijal. I mean, from the men. I'm not talking about the women. We don't talk about how we love our, our wives in this context. Tell them who you love from the men. So the Prophet says, Abuha, her dad. Abu Bakr. He said, Then who? He said, then Umar. He said, then I stopped because I was afraid he'd never get to my name. I was like, all right, I lost this one. You know, Aisha, Abu Bakr, and Umar. But it shows you, again, the immediate love the Prophet ﷺ showed to someone when they converted to Islam, even if they did heinous things to them, right, to the Muslims. And that was a means of bringing them up in Islam. And so Amr radiallahu anhu truly starts to develop his own qualities. There's another uh, narration uh, where many of, the, many of the Sahaba, they narrated that one time they were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is from Alqama ibn Rathma. He says, we were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on a journey. Fana'as, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got tired on this expedition. So he said, Yarhamullahu Amrah. May Allah have mercy on Amr. And again, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got tired, another point of the journey, he said, Yarhamullahu Amrah. May Allah have mercy on Amr. And he said it a third time, May Allah have mercy on Amr. Fatadakarna. Like there were a lot of Amrs amongst the companions. So he said, which Amr is he talking about? So he said to the Prophet ﷺ, which Amr are you talking about? May Allah have mercy on Amr. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Amr ibn As. And again, this is surprising. The history of Amr ibn As. So they said, وَمَا شَأْنُ Why him, Ya Rasulullah? 
So the Prophet says, Kuntu ida nadabtu nasa ila sadaqa ja'a fa'abzala minha. When I would tell the people to donate for the sake of Allah, Amr would come and he would bring all that he has. فَأَقُولُ يَا Amr, And I would say to him, Oh Amr, anna laka hadha. Where did this all come from? And he would respond and he would say, مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ From Allah. And I would say, وَصَدَقَ Amr, إِنَّ لَهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا He has much good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of that money that he inherited, you could, the Prophet started to see the detachment from wealth. Right? So there's the detachment from his old ways and it's materializing. His motives are changing. His intentions are changing. His personality is slowly being molded. The money is being donated for the sake of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ trusts him and he sends him as a governor of Bahrain. And then he sends him to Oman. And while he was in charge of Oman, many people embraced Islam uh, in Oman. Because remember, the Muslims would not force the people to embrace Islam. There is no compulsion in religion. They did not force the people of that land to become Muslim even if they were victorious. But under Amr al-As, many people of Oman became Muslim, and he stayed in that place until the Prophet ﷺ died. So Amr ibn As was transitioned to Oman as the governor, as the Amir of Oman, until the death of the Prophet ﷺ. After the Prophet ﷺ passes away, he and Khalid ibn Walid anhu together play a pivotal role in Hurub al-Ridda, in the battle with the apostates. Of course, Musayl ibn al-Kadhab is the false prophet and he's literally slaughtering Muslims and claiming to be the prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Hafid ibn Kathir rahimahullah actually narrates a really interesting incident. He says that Amr al As actually bumped into Musaylimah himself. He was on his way back to Medina, and he bumped into Musaylimah, the false prophet. So Musaylimah knows Amr, and Amr knows Musaylimah. Musaylimah says, "Have you heard that I am a prophet like the prophet of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam?" So okay, interesting. So he said that Musaylimah then tilted his head and he started to read some of his ridiculous imitation of the Qur'an. Right? And it's actually narrated in Kathir. It is ridiculous lines. Musaylimah would basically just put a bunch of rhymes together like poetry and say this came from Allah and he tilt his head in a funny way to show that he was receiving revelation. So he said to Amr, ma ra'yuk? What do you think? Amr said, Wallahi inni a'lamu annaka la ta'lamu anni a'lamu annaka kathib. I swear by Allah that you know, that I know, that you know, that I know you're a liar. <laughs> like we both know, that's a bunch of garbage, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he said, I just made my way back, right? Musaylimah didn't put his hands on him and this was just like, you know that I know, that I know that you know, or something like that, right? Gets a little confusing even in Arabic. In any case, Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu serves a critical role under Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, but it's really in the time of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu that we see him shine. And Umar radiallahu anhu had a statement about Amr ibn As. قَالَ مَا يَنْبَغِي لِأَبِي عَبْدِ اللَّهِ أَنْ يَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا أَمِيرًا This is a high testimony. He says, it is not befitting for Amr ibn As to walk on this earth except as a leader. The man has to be a leader. Some people don't fit except in that position. So he will be a commander, he will be a leader as long as he is alive. And so Khalid radiallahu anhu cutting deep into the Persian Empire, Amr ibn As radiallahu ta'ala anhu cutting deep into the Roman Empire, their paths converge in Ajnadin and Yarmouk, and Amr ibn As and Khalid and Shurahbil and Abu Ubaidah are all coming together, and now they are bringing the Roman Empire to its knees. After the Romans and the Persians have dominated for so long, they're bringing the Roman Empire to its knees. Now subhanAllah, most of Palestine, most of Palestine is actually taken by Amr ibn As So the entire southern part of Palestine, if you were to take Palestine, if you were to look at the bottom half of it, all of that is Amr ibn As leading his armies in the conquest of Palestine, of Palestine, and basically setting up then Jerusalem to where Abu Ubaidah radiallahu ta'ala anhu will then move forward to negotiate the terms and Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu will come and will take the keys of Jerusalem peacefully, right, peacefully. And not exact any type of bloodshed on the Romans and even bring back the Jewish families that were expelled by the Christians to live peacefully in Jerusalem. But Amr radiallahu anhu is the one who, who conquers all of that land 
south of Al-Quds, south of Jerusalem, under Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, and brings it all under Islam. He takes Ayla, and then he takes Ramla, and then he gets to the Babylonian fort, and he, he, he faces the Amir of the Romans, who's known as Artabun al-Rum. Artabun al-Rum was basically the most intelligent Roman leader. And so the Arabs called him the Amr ibn As of the Romans, and the Romans called Amr ibn As the Artabun of the Arab. It's really interesting here. So it's kind of like them meeting each other, a meeting of the minds. Extremely intelligent military commanders, and the Artabun of Rum is impossible to outsmart. Amr ibn As is impossible to outsmart. When Umar ibn Khattab anhu heard that their two uh, armies were meeting, he said, "Ramayna artabun al-Rum bi artabun al-Arab, fanzuru amma tanfarj." That we have basically put up against artabun al-Rum, the artabun of the Romans, the artabun of the Arabs, and see which one of them is able to overcome the other. Amr ibn As comes up with this risky strategy because he's Amr ibn As of the Allah and who with him. Remember, Amr used to travel all that land before Islam. He knows the land inside out. But he basically wants to outsmart the man by figuring out what his internal forces are and what his, what his actual palace looks like. So what Amr does is he disguises himself as a messenger of himself. So he actually, I mean, it's super risky. He walks in to meet Artabun al-Rum, acting like he's just the ambassador of Amr ibn As, like some average Muslim. And while he gets in there, he takes note of everything that's on the inside. He kind of analyzes the place. He's coming up with a plan of how to overcome the guy. And while he is talking to him and interacting with him, uh, Artabun al-Rum actually figures out that it's him. So this guy is too intelligent. And so Artabun al-Rum signals to his guards in a way that Amr catches to basically take him out. So now Amr has to pivot, right? So what does Amr ibn As say to him uh, as he sees this all pain, uh, taking place? He says, Ayyuha al-Amir, said, oh, you know, leader, inni qad sami'tu kalamak wa sami'ta kalami. I have heard your words and you have heard my words. Wa inni wahidun min asharatin ba'athana Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. That I am one of tens of the best of companions that Umar al-Khattab sent meaning the leaders of the companions. He doesn't tell him he's Amr ibn As. So he says, I'm going to go and get all of them. How about I go and get all of them to come meet you as well with me? Let me go get the 20 or 30 best of the companions to come talk to you. So the Artabun of Rum, he says, oh, this is a great idea. Now I can kill all of them. Like bring me the 20 or 30 best of the companions and I'll take them all out. So he says, فَذْهَبْ فَأْتِنِي بِهِمْ Go ahead and, and go and get your, your companions with you. So as soon as Amr ibn As gets out, Amr ibn As anhu takes off, creates all sorts of diversions. And at that point, he says, خَدَعَنِ rajul." He said, the man deceived me. هَذَا وَاللَّهِ أَدْهَ Arab. This is the most cunning of the Arabs. He got me. He got away and he got me and he understands now the internal. And indeed, subhanAllah, he defeated him. Amr ibn As who defeated him. And this was sort of the last stronghold of the Romans within Palestine, within Palestine. But then, subhanAllah, what does he set his eyes on? Masr, Egypt. Hence why all of the Egyptians love Amr ibn As. He set his eyes on Masr. Amr ibn Khattab told Amr ibn As, calm down. We already have the Romans and the Persians that we're dealing with. Egypt is a whole nother reign. We don't want to touch Egypt. Leave Masr alone. Amr ibn As says, I've got 4,000. They've got 120,000, but I have a plan. <laughs> Amr ibn Khattab is very skeptical. Now, here's the situation with Egypt. Egypt is under which empire? Under the Roman Empire. Okay? But subhanAllah, it would just so happen that the Persians captured Masr from the Roman control for about a decade during their battles. So it was weakened on the inside. There was still quite a bit of political instability. And here is where it gets very interesting. The Egyptian Christians are Coptic Christians. And they're not welcomed by the Roman 
Christians who, of course, are following a very, I guess, Catholic Christianity, if you will. Just like with the Crusaders, they didn't just kill all the Muslims and the Jews, they killed all the Eastern Christians as well. The Christians of Egypt are not treated like insiders by the Byzantines. And so they're developing a resentment towards them as well. They don't like the way they're being treated by them as well. And Amr ibn As is smart. So Amr ibn As, where does he station himself? Who can tell me? Gaza. Not just that. Amr ibn As stations himself in Rafah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for the people of Rafah. SubhanAllah, all the letters between Umar and Amr ibn As take place from Rafah to Medina. And Amr radiallahu anhu camps in Rafah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for the people and bring back that blessing. Imagine the Sahaba, the companions there in Rafah. And Amr is negotiating terms with the people of Egypt. And he's speaking to a mindset. He's speaking to the Copts. And he says to them that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, he promised us that one day Allah would open Egypt for us. And when we got there, we should treat them with kindness because they are our kin through our mother Hajar. The mother of Ismail, the mother of Ismail alayhi salam, Hajar. So Christian, or initially they say a Coptic as Ibn Kathir rahimullah says, but from Masr. So we were told that we should treat the people of Masr with goodness. So Amr ibn As anhu is at the border of Egypt and Palestine, set up in Rafah. And Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu comes to know that the Romans, the Byzantines, are basically uh, recollecting themselves in Masr so that they can fight against the Muslims there. And Amr radiallahu anhu sends a letter to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, I'm going in. Umar gets the letter. He, Uthman says to Umar, send a letter to Amr ibn As, tell him not to go into Egypt. But if the letter reaches him while he's already in Egypt, then go ahead. So basically, if he's still in Gaza, if he's still in Rafah, tell him come back to Medina, tell him stop. But if he's already in Egypt, then tell him Bismillah. And if he needs reinforcements, we'll send reinforcements. This is of course summarizing for the sake of time, much of what happens in this communication. So Amr ibn As anhu knows that the messenger of Umar is coming and he happens to see Uqba ibn Amr coming with the letter. And this is Amr ibn As anhu. He doesn't want to not, he, doesn't, he wants to go forth in Egypt. So he goes into Masr because he has a feeling what's in that letter. And he receives the letter in Egypt. So he could say to Umar ibn Khattab, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, the letter came to me while I was already in Masr. And he goes forth in Egypt. And of course, they are able to take Masr. What's the oldest city in Egypt before testing the, the Egyptians here? Don't say Qahira, don't say Cairo. Skandariya, Alexandria. He's able to take Alexandria. And then Amr ibn As is able to, with many of the Copts, by the way, even in Egypt, is able to exert control over Masr, bring Masr into Islam with just 4,000 men, subhanAllah. Just 4,000 men. And the Byzantines flee Masr, they flee Egypt as well. And while he is there, many of the people become Muslim, by the way, because of the way that they were treated. In fact, many of the books that talk about the history of Muslim empire living under Muslim rule talk about the treatment particularly of the people of Egypt under Amr ibn As under the early Muslims. The way they were treated fairly, as, in, as opposed to the way that they're, they're, the Romans treated them, even though they're technically all Christians. Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu takes Skandariya and he builds the city. And I know this has gone long, so I'll, I'll, I'll sum up inshallah ta'ala. He builds the city known as Fustat, which is the city of tents. Umar radiallahu anhu told Amr ibn As that don't make the, the base of the Muslims in Skandariya because it needs to be closer to Medina, it needs to be closer inland. He didn't like the idea of Muslims being on a border town to the water as their place. So he said, you need to stay close, so build something closer. So Amr radiallahu anhu in those tents, where those tents are, builds out the city of Fustat, which is today known as what? Old Cairo. So Qahira which comes later on, three centuries later, actually becomes, you know, absorbs what was Fustat, the city 
that he would develop. He turns it into an amazing city. Ubadat ibn Samat radiallahu anhu architects it. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu moves there. This becomes, outside of Medina, Fustat becomes a place where so many Sahaba live in the same neighborhood. And they build a masjid. And what is that masjid called until today? Masjid Amr ibn As. So the very famous Masjid Amr ibn As is actually where they established themselves in Masr, in Egypt, that first time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restore it back to its glory and restore Rafah and Gaza back to its glory and descend upon it tranquility and ease and victory as he once did with the small group of believers. Allahumma ameen. Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu was dying at the age of 90 years old and SubhanAllah, I just want to quote to you the conversations between him and his son at his death. Sahih Muslim, as Amr is dying, he's talking to his son Abdullah ibn Amr about what's happening. And he's starting to feel regret over the phases of his life. And Abdullah is trying to give him hope and Amr says to him that I divide my life into three phases. There was the first phase where I fought against the Prophet Wasallam, and if I would have died in that phase, I would have certainly been from the people of Hellfire. Then he said, and there was the second phase in which I embraced Islam, and I was alongside the Prophet Wasallam. and if I would have died then, I would have been certain that I'm from the people of Paradise. But he said, afterwards, I just don't know about myself. You know, there was politics, there was fitna, there was a lot that Amr radiallahu anhu got involved with, and indeed he actually made mistakes radiallahu anhu during the course of the fitna. He's like, I don't know this third phase of my life, I don't know which of my states I will be in when I pass away. So Abdullah says to him, Ma hadha al jazahu? What is this fear of yours? Waqad kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yudnika wa yasta'minuka. Prophet used to bring you close to him and he used to put you in charge of important things. Like clearly the Prophet loves you. And he said, Ay bunay, qad kana dhalik. He said, Oh my son, indeed it was like that. Wasa and I will tell you, Ay wallahi ma adri, ahubban kama kana amta alufan. I don't know if the Prophet did that because he really loved me or the Prophet was trying to soften my heart, like he was trying to bring me along because he know he knew how hard my heart was. But he said, I can't rely on that. But I can tell you two men that the Prophet left this world loving. Ibn Sumayya wa Ibn Ummi Abd. Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu anhu and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So I know those two men, like they're different. The Prophet left this world loving them, the early muhajireen, and they should be sure of themselves. But me, I don't know. And then he looked up and he made this dua. Qal, Allahumma inna ka amarta bi umur. Oh Allah, you commanded us to do certain things. Wa nahayta an umur. And you forbade us from doing certain things. Tarakna kathiran mimma amartana. We left off much of what you used to command us to do. Wa rata'na fi kathiran mimma nahayta. And we unfortunately indulged in things that you told us not to indulge in. Allahumma la ilaha illa ant. Oh Allah, there is no God but you. And Abdullah says that he raised his finger to the sky and he kept on at that point saying, La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah, until he passed away saying, La ilaha illallah. So Allah granted him death, this man radiallahu ta'ala anhu, upon La ilaha illallah over the age of 90 years old. He only narrated about 40 ahadith. But the khair, the goodness that we see that came out of the ummah through him is plentiful. We ask Allah to accept from him and to forgive us for our shortcomings. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that as he descended goodness and victory upon that land, that he does so again. And then as we read about the glory of Rafah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our people in Rafah and in Gaza again, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restore Musr, restore Egypt as a place of glory as well. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us as an ummah for our shortcomings. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khayra. Inshallah ta'ala. Next week we'll continue with Ikrama ibn Abi Jahl. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.